Well, welcome everyone to another uh, Conquest Collins show live with here with uh, Matt Zemick and myself. This is the show where you guys are the stars. We want to have a platform for all the USC fans to come here, sound off on all their thoughts and everything that's on their minds. Tonight, we have a couple of things we're throwing on the table. Obviously, USC lost its running back coach, Kyle McDonald, to uh, the, the Chargers. Uh, there's a huge injunction that went down in Tennessee that's going to directly be tied to NIL, and I'm wondering uh, if we can turn up our own NIL program because of it. Uh, and a lot on the table. I don't want to limit you guys. Remember, though, here's one thing. There's the phone number. We are not using the phone lines tonight. I'm going to drop the link to uh, the StreamYard, and you guys will be joining via StreamYard tonight. Uh, we're having some issues with the phone lines, and last week we had the same kind of issue, and we wasted 20 minutes. So tonight we're just going to get started, uh, and we're going to be taking callers via stream, uh, StreamYard. So I'm going to drop the I'm going to drop the link um, in. Hey, I want to try something really quick, actually, Matt. Uh, first caller, let's just try this really quick. Hello, caller. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah. And uh, how about chat? Can you guys hear? Can you guys hear Gary? Yeah, this is Gary from Dana Point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm watching you on TV. And I'm on my phone. I'm a little bit of a delay. Hey, I I heard the news about this NIL thing. There's a, there's a famous quote. I can't remember where it's from. When you take your shot at the king, you best not miss. Well, Tennessee took their shot. And now the federal judge has issued an injunction on NIL to prevent NIL from being prohibited in any form. And the judge apparently said, I haven't read the decision. I am a former lawyer and a former juvenile court judge. But it looks like he said until the conclusion of the case. Well, that means that could be years. And so what I'm concerned about is that everybody jumping up and down saying, hey, boy, now all the gloves are off and let's go get them. Oh, really? Well, I'm not so sure I think that's a great thing. Isn't The victory may be a Pyrrhic one because now where are the limitations on anything? Who says you can only get 25 scholarships? Who says your roster can only be 85? Who says you can only have two official visits per a, 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 uh, recruit or something? In other words, it, I, I'm wary of this. I'm very wary of it. Um, I love college football. But I'm thinking that we're just going to turn into the NFL, and it really concerns me because, you know, when you get what you want, you have to be careful what you thought you wanted. And so I'm very concerned about it, and I know you guys are up on it because you led on this uh, as you opened up. So I'm very uh, curious to see what you guys think. But I myself am, uh, I know I'm a traditionalist, but nevertheless, I'm a realist. And I know chaos can come when you don't expect it. So I'm curious to see what you guys think. Matt, what are your th initial thoughts? So Gary, I mean, I share your overall concerns. Like, I, like, you know, given that NIL has been poorly implemented to begin with, like the concept makes sense. And of course the players should be getting compensated richly, but the way it's being implemented and has been implemented hasn't worked out well. And I don't think anyone would say, oh, this is how it was intended. This was this was the structure that we all had in mind all along. And so now, you know, this is an invitation to become even more like the wild, wild west, uh, you know, inmates running the asylum. So I share your concern there. As for the USC angle, here's what I think. Jen Cohen, I think, as most USC fans and USC watchers know, she's been very out there in terms of saying, you know, we want to do NIL the right way. We want to go about this the right way. We want to be responsible. Uh, not that USC is going to start being irresponsible, <laughs> but this might give Jen Cohen a little bit of license, a little bit of freedom to take more liberties and to not be quite as concerned, quite as cautious because if it's a free for all, you know, well, if it's a free for all, <laughs> then is USC really taking the same risks that we, we might have perceived a week ago? I know Tim talked about this, that Jen Cohen, you know, mindful of what happened with Reggie Bush, Paul D, uh, Todd McNair, all that stuff from 2010 with the NCAA, you know, Tim mentioned, and I think he's correct, that Jen Cohen wants to be cautious because, you know, the NCA could just zero in on USC like a laser beam 
and bring down the hammer if the Trojans, uh, you know, are are loose with all of this. But maybe this gives USC and Jen Cohen a little bit more perceived freedom. Like, hey, Tennessee stood up to the NCAA and seems to have won a victory. And Tennessee, you know, was definitely playing in the gray areas if it wasn't already <laughs> stepping way over them. So if Tennessee can do that and not get hit, that might give people inside USC the freedom to say, you know, f this. We're gonna we're gonna rock and roll. We're gonna we're gonna take bigger swings. So bad for college football, but there I, there I think there's a real chance it could improve some outcomes for USC. No question about it. Yeah, I, 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 I'm. That's where I am in between all this. I do remember that the Gen Cohen came out and said, "Look, we're gonna get some clear, you know, some things to be clarified for us in the in the summertime. Uh, we want to move toward this. We we're we're trying to work with our collective." She was wearing, you know, the uh, a, the collective shirt sh t shirt, you know. So she had um, she she's on board, but there was still that hesitancy, like you know, USC's kind of gun shy because we've been, you know, we've been hammered. Uh, it just seems like every way along, like we talked about last week, just seems like whatever everyone does everything, right? I'm not saying if everyone's speeding, no one should get pulled over. I'm just saying it just seems like, man, it just seems like USC gets pulled over every time. And, and you know, the farther you are to the north, Midwest, and farther you are down southeast, the more lax these rules seem to be. And they really just come after these upstarts out here out west. So um, I'll be interested to see if USC does take this and go, all right, this is this is a minor thing. Uh, you talked about the scholarship limits, all that. I think where the NCAA's hands are tied, you would I mean you're a judge, so you would know much more about this than me, is just simply on the fact that the NI on the money, you can't limit people making money, but they can still make their rules their way. The rules themselves, as far as like uh scholarship limits and stuff, I'm assuming those those are could be in play. Are you maybe talking about fine? We don't give you a scholarship, we'll just we'll just pay for you know, we'll, you know, some NIA will pay for your tuition. I mean, there's other things that could probably go around, I'm sure, right? Whenever there's a law, there's five other, you know, if a lawyer makes a law, there's five other lawyers trying to figure out how they can get around the law, right? So, I mean, I think that that's, um, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. So I kind of caught myself off right there. I think it might could open up the wild, wild west. I'm excited, Gary, that, um, I do think that USC is going to have to react to this. So is it, in, are they going to go full on Tennessee and start handing out McDonald's bags? Probably not, but they're going to have to go in some direction. You know what I mean? They can't just sit back and allow this and allow Tennessee to be outright in their house, just paying people because if they do that, by the time we get some real clarity in all this, they are gonna be so far behind. There'd be like five recruiting classes, you know, knee deep. In it. And the thing about the, the sec is they've always made their own freaking rules. It seems like, so, I mean, this is nothing new. This is nothing new. At Tennessee says, screw you. We're going to, we want, but I think USC does have to uh, take the patron and then go for it. And Roger thinks we should hand about in and out uh, burger bags. Yeah, that that's, that would probably be the California way, Roger. Yeah, any thoughts on all that, Gary? The only thing I, I'm saying is that uh, there's always <laughs> unintended consequences, and that is what really bothers me. Uh, you know, you say that, well, that scholarships are, let's say, sacrosanct, but – I'm just wondering where it stops and what is the unraveling that could take place. I don't expect you guys to be prophetic and have an answer for that, but it, it worries me a little bit uh, because of the traditions of college football and so on. I just don't want it to turn into a mini and and uh, FL. That's all. Anyway, thanks for your thoughts. Now I appreciate hearing from you guys. You're the best. Yeah. The one thing Gary, I'll say right now real quick. The one thing I was worried about if I did not have the phone lines, I thought, I think I said it to you, Matt, even before. Was, we're going to miss Gary's call or something like that. I, I, I said that because I didn't, I didn't think you were going to get a streamer link and hop in. So I just thought, you know, why don't we go low tech? I'll go straight off of my my phone and, and, right, and right into the mic. So I guess we're going to do that for right now. Um, but Gary, I always appreciate your, your thoughtful responses and, and questions. So thanks for calling in, Gary. I'll talk to you soon. Hey, great. Love you guys. Bye. Bye on, Gary. Yeah, and then we talked about N the NFL light, right? I mean, if, if, if you're going to turn it to the NFL light, the closer we get to the NFL, they're going to want to go watch NFL players. But why would you want to watch an inferior product? What made USC, uh, what, USC what made college football and USC great in a, in, a, in a sports town that has the Dodgers, the Kings, the Lakers, right? It, it was, was the fact that they were, it was different. It was a different, it really was 
different clock rules, you know, different playoff system or lack thereof. There was the bowl system, the the regionality of everything. We're slowly now, now rapidly, it's almost getting exponentially faster, stripping away what made this sport what it is. And I guess it was inevitable, right? The, there was poor leadership. The NCAA they could have nipped this whole thing in the bud a long time ago, right? If they just slowly started paying the players like they should have. Um, poor leadership has led us to this point. And at this point, I don't know if there's any saving really what we've known. I mean, let's face it, you guys. If you think 2024 is be anything like we've seen in the past, you, you're already wrong. And when they change the structure again and so that we have something through 2020 sit 25 season, we'll talk about that where we're gonna do the five set five plus seven rule or, or model. But then in 2026, I think they're gonna open it up all again. And we don't even know what that's gonna look like, you know. So uh, the thought that this is going to be the same sport that I grew up with in the 80s and 90s, watching all those great games and all the, again, the bowl games, the regionality, everything. I think those days are gone. Well, it looks like uh, we have our one call for the night. So thank you all for tuning in. Appreciate everybody coming to see us. But uh, looks like that might be it. Thanks, John, for helping us out. Oh, by the way, um, thanks a lot. It means a lot to me. Uh, I just lost you. Uh, Trojan Blade, uh, my buddy Trojan, uh, over there, Gabe. Uh, really appreciate the the uh, the kudos from you, especially. Uh, thank you so much for stopping by um, and leaving that for us. Uh, appreciate it. We do. Sometimes we work harder than others. Right now, we're just kind of flying by the seat of our pants, but uh, we appreciate everybody being here as as always. So, Matt, let's talk about that a little bit, the 5-7 model. It's just a little bit of change. We knew it was going to happen, right? Because as soon as the Pac-12 blew up, as soon as, you know, the, the, well, the Power 4 from the Pac-12 went to the Big Ten, and then and it just started unraveling to the big, you know, the Big Twelve, and then and then the ACC leaving just Washington State and Oregon State. You knew that they were they were no longer be a Power Five. This was just the next uh, logical step. I mean, the the thing that gets me about this uh, five plus seven model is that Notre Dame, because it's not in a conference, like I I thought Notre Dame would be accommodated more. I did not think they would go with a model which ba would basically lock in Notre Dame outside the top four, outside a first round buy. So like Notre Dame, at least in 2024 and 2025, it's going to have to win four games to win the national title. I mean, like Notre Dame won't have a chance to get one of those top four seeds and, and one of those uh, first round buys. I, I, I'm just surprised by that. Now, of course, a lot of people will just say, well, Marcus Freeman doesn't have a, a, a high end caliber program. Notre Dame is not even going to get to the playoff. That might be true, but still, I'm, I am surprised that Notre Dame did not have enough clout in the room uh, to get, you know, to be in contention for a top four uh, seed and, and a first round buy. That to me is the biggest story of that. Okay, well, Michelle, we should have um, had Gary hang around to answer this for you because, uh, again, my we're starting to get into the legal ease of this probably going to get way out of my the realm of my education and my knowledge. But it's an injunction. And my understanding of an injunction is basically it's just an action by the court saying, hang on, you can't do anything right now. Freeze, kind of freeze things. So meaning I believe, Matt, you can clear this up for me, that, that the NCAA can't act on, on the fact that they're going to try to sanction uh, Tennessee for, the, for the, the, the rules violations. Is that correct? Is it like a, a stay for right now until there's actually a case that goes out? Or is this thing permanent? Can you, can you want to clear that up for me if you know? Or any lawyers or, or uh, judges yeah, in the I, in the audience? I am not going to wade into uh, the area of litigation. Uh, you know, if if you don't know something, then don't try and talk about it. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll just I'll just stop just short of it. I mean, I what I do understand of an injunction is a temporary thing within within court proceedings. It's just basically to stop people from acting. I guess I don't know. I'll stop. I right would there. Only say, this is not legal advice. This is not. <laughs> what do you guys say here? I would only say following the college football journalists that I follow, you know, all across uh, college football Twitter uh, this evening, like they're all saying, you know, the Tennessee won, uh, the NCAA lost, and and here we go. Like that, that seems to be the consensus opinion that the NCAA is 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 fighting a losing battle here, and one should not expect uh, today's uh, result to be undone. But like that's a political situational read i'm not going to speak about the, the 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 turnings of the gears in the legal system i i'm not going to claim to, that i know anything about that right yeah it's just it's just starting to show when you when you had the 
the Supreme Court, initial Supreme Court ruling, the language and that in the ruling, and then now you'd see a, a district judge slapping an injunction, you know, basically hand, hand, uh, tying the hands of the NCAA. This is just right. These are just a precursor to what's coming down the road. Uh, I think is what Matt's trying to say, and I, and I, I kind of agree. The writing's on the wall that they're they're not going to be able to stop uh, NIL and, or people getting paid, and that's just the next step. So now it's going to come down to I think the big two, right? I think it'll come down to the end that the big the Big Ten and the SEC are going to have to come up with some kind. Of, that's where it's going to turn to you guys. Hopefully, we can keep ESPN and Fox out of this thing, but you know they're all in bed together uh, with all those billions and billions of dollars in TV contracts, but. Uh, I hope it comes down to, and, and most likely it will come down to the bigger conferences saying, hey, this is how we want to structure things, et cetera, et cetera. And isn't it interesting that after that five plus seven model for 2024, uh, you know, was reported, uh, then there was a whole round of fresh discussions about uh, bumping up the playoff field to 14 or 16 for 2026. It's it, The sequencing of that is really interesting and the leaks and the reports and the rumors uh, and, and how all that's going down. Uh, just it's, it's, it's a pretty bizarre situation. In other words, pretty normal for college football. Yeah. And then Gary, uh, thank you so much for the, for clearing that up for us. And then also thank you so much uh, for the super, the $20 super sticker, Gary, you're, you're, you're too kind. Really, really appreciate you uh, joining us here calling. And on top of that, uh, Throwing a little coin in our pocket. So really, really appreciate you uh, doing all those things for us. And then um, Mark said, inducement is no longer a naughty word. That's what it looks like now. It kind of looks like, I mean, the, the program that pushed it the most, you got, you know, Tennessee caught with their hand in the cookie jar and they're like, can't touch us. So I guess at that point, you know, what what else really can you do? Um, so yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. Caller, you just called. Sorry, I, I did miss the call because I'm doing this a little bit backwards, low tech, you know, cell phone, whatever. I'm not hearing it ringing in my headphones. So if you call, go ahead and call back in. Um, John brings in a very good point here. He's asking how long before uh, Reggie Bush gets his Heisman back. You know what I mean? A lot of stuff. And I, I, I wanted to talk about it as well on the show. Uh, did you guys hear uh, Shannon Sharp had an interview with, uh, with uh, Johnny Manziel again? Johnny, someone's going to advise Johnny Manziel just to step back and stay away from a microphone for a while because he he keeps like he he keeps telling you how the sausage is made. He keeps you know he's he's being pretty candid about all this stuff. And he flat out said, I'm, "Again, go check it out, Shannon Sharp. I don't know the name of the podcast, but my recollection, he basically said that when he was thinking about going pro, and he was at Texas A and M, his dad approached Kevin Sumlin and said, "Hey, three million bucks." You got us for two more years. We'll hang around. We'll hang around for two more years. Just flat out told him. Now, someone said no, um, but I don't think it was much that it wasn't that was the way it was done because Manziel said, hey, look, all these schools. And he named LSU and Alabama by name, said all these schools have bag men. And you just say, you just say, you what's your number? And you go up to them and, and, and they give you the money. Um, and then he also clarified and said that you know, all the major teams that are in the hunt for a national title. Uh, I don't know how that true that is. I do know that if you have a school and you guys have ever sniffed a national title, you have alumni that have given, has given, you know, hundred dollar handshakes to two players. And quite frankly, I'm glad they did because you guys listen, these guys have been starving for decades, living on scraps while everyone, while the universities and TVs get rich, these guys and their families are living on scraps. So I'm glad. I hope they got lots of hundred dollar handshakes. I mean, I hope they got thousand dollar handshakes. But uh, the truth of the matter is, this has been going on forever. And I remember, I can't remember. I wish I could remember who told me. It was one of my friends. But they were basically saying, you know, the schools that just jumped onto the NIL um, um, bandwagon right away. And we're just, and we're just like purring from word go. He's all those guys already had a system in place of donors that are giving money to bring kids to their school. They, they already had this. This is just now it's just all about the table. All that stuff that was going on in the underbelly of college football, you know, what was going on in those back rooms, right? All of a sudden now it's like, hey, you want a Nike deal? Or hey, do you want do you want this? Whatever. And then all, all of a sudden it, then it's it's legal. So um boom, pop up, and all of a sudden you have a collective. Some other programs had a little harder time getting those collectives going. And that might tell you what the programs were. They were actually throwing all this cash out from day one. 
So, uh, yes, by the way, we do. But well, good point. Why don't we do it right now? Give Reggie his Heisman back. It's been far too long. Uh, you know, it, it's ridiculous. It's been 4,897 days since you guys stole his trophy. Give Reggie his damn trophy back, please. And then I promise I'll stop calling you guys out, Mr. Baker. I'll stop calling. Well, don't worry about it. Reggie Bush is the least of their worries at this point, Matt. You know, you would think at this point they would want to start saying, okay, look, the ship's going down. Let's give amnesty to all the criminals. Let's let them go. We're all going to die. Let's just, let's just let everything go, right? But no, no, they don't need to take the low-hanging fruit and get some goodwill and, and, and show people that they are human. They're still going to keep sticking these stupid rules that they had. Well, one, one, about just about Reggie Bush, while we're talking about it, I mean, one thing to remember is that the Heisman Trust, uh, you know, the, the organization which oversees uh, the Heisman Trophy, like I've had a beef with the Heisman Trust for a very long time. Um, in, in terms of the way it does business. One of the one of the, my main gripes with the Heisman Trust is, you know, why they limit the Heisman Trophy to, you know, three, four, usually no more than five players. I, for a long time, for several years, I've believed that there should be at least 10 Heisman Trophy uh, candidates going to New York, getting that trip, getting that fun experience. The Heisman Trophy needs to represent defensive players. The Heisman Trophy needs to represent group of five schools, the Heisman Trophy needs to represent uh, special teamers. It needs to represent, you know, lots of different slices of the of the larger college football experience. And yet, the Heisman Trust is, you know, limiting it, you know, to usually just three or four. The Heisman Trust is a backwards Neanderthalish organization. So, you know, in addition to you know the NCA and Charlie Baker, all we also have uh, the Heisman Trust is just way behind the times. Uh, and and runs a, a, a trophy presentation that I could not care about at all. Uh, I've I, you know I used to watch Heisman ceremonies when I was a, a kid and a teenager, but like I, I can't uh, tell you the last time I watched an actual Heisman Trophy ceremony with any degree of interest. You didn't watch Caleb Williams ceremony, Matt. No, because no. because the Heisman process is you know full of it, and and like I knew oh, Caleb yeah. Williams was going to win, and I had to prepare my stories at Trojans Wire anyway. So, just waiting for the announcement. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, again, either our phones are broken, or uh, we got a lot of shy people, which is fine because again, Matt and I need to get out here early. We did kind of say we want to call it, make it a quick show. This is your show. If you guys don't want to call in, you know, Mark, Matt, and I get together on Monday. We talk SC football. This is this is your voice. This is your guys' chance to talk. So we're gonna hang out for a little bit. I got a couple more things on my rundown I wanted to talk about, um, and and then we we can move on. Um, let me get this last super chat here really quick. Oh, not a super chat. Uh, fight on. Thank you again. Another great, another one of our our, our great. Uh, Loyal viewers, a fight on. Thank you for the five gifted USC uh, memberships. You guys go ahead and grab those. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that works or if they've already been doled out. I don't know how. I got to find I got to look at that. I got to find out. And then fight on again, follows that up with another one. Uh, bye bye and crooked two for from Frank uh, in, in Tucson. So, Frank, um, They've always been a mess, haven't they? I, I mean, I one of these days, if we should just have a show just talking about the capriciousness of the NCAA, how some programs, and USC is not the only one, get hammered, and then there's your sacred cows that seem to do... Look, I mean, look at Miami, what Miami did. Um, you know, under, under Paul D's watch of all people who hammered USC, they got away scot-free. Why? Because they just said, well, we'll take you to court. And I think now we're seeing USC should have taken the NCAA to court because, well, they should have taken them to court. Yeah, Moose, you 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 used that joke about three weeks ago. I mean, oh, uh, I'm okay. not. I, I would. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. First I'm a, time I saw uh, it. I wouldn't say that I'm a Hall and Oates fan whatsoever. It's really not my cup of tea music. But this is actually Matt Leinert's um, brand, and I love the hat, so I bought it. This looks like someone trying to bail out sinking Titanic with a teacup. Yeah, I think. I think it's over. I think. I think the day to do something to salvage whatever they had, uh, whatever control they had as far as my financial. And that goes for all the pres Remember, guys, the NCAA is not some foreign entity. The NCAA is set up by the, the university presidents 
who were making hand over fist cash, greedy, not sharing it with the players, not sharing it with their families. And then, God forbid, these families get a couple of thousand dollars. So they, I don't know, they can pay rents or, or whatever. Then they come at them and make their kid ineligible and try to wreck their, their, their future career. I mean, the NCAA really uh, it has it coming. And when I say the NCAA, we're talking about these universities. Now, the bigger universities are going to be fine. But some of these smaller universities are the ones that are going to take uh, end up paying the bill, Matt. I, I'm seeing in the chat people are trying to call in. Really? Because I'm not even – I'm surprised, I was surprised getting, we weren't getting anything. They're getting voicemail. They're getting voicemail. That's weird. It's going to my – okay, well, hold on. Let me double-check it. Matt, discuss right. amongst yourselves. Let me try to see if the figure phone's out real fast. Sure. Well, while, while Tim's uh, taking care of this uh, technical issue, um, just just want to tell you that, you know, we, we took what uh, the USC defensive coaches uh, said last week and, uh, you know, went into the details on any of those – all of those things at uh, at Trojans Wire, and uh, w one of the things you know, just kind of sifting through all of those press conference remarks from last week, and it was a very subtle thing, but it was mentioned. Like you know, no detail is is unimportant. Like whenever you watch a mystery drama or a crime show, no detail is unimportant, right? And I just thought it was a little bit funny. I mean, truthful, but still funny that Lincoln Riley just kind of quietly said, wow, you know, you at UCLA in 2022, like we remember that game uh, in Pasadena and how wild it was. And then Danton Lynn comes in there and the improvement that UCLA made from 2022 uh, was one of the things that impressed me. So like he was, you know, explaining just in a very matter of fact way why Danton Lynn stood out for him as a choice for defensive coordinator, but he was able to kind of bust the Bruins chops a little bit by noting how absolutely horrible they were uh, on defense in 2022. Just, you know, looking over my notes from all those press conferences, from all those uh, comments by Lincoln Riley uh, and the defensive coaches last week, that that's one thing that stuck with me. All right, Tim, do we have a technical resolution? Well, we do have a caller, so um, okay. I don't know what – all right, so caller, hi. What's your name? Where are you calling from? It's Keith from Irvine. Keith from Irvine. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks for calling. What's on your mind? Well, you know, I'm a little under the weather today, so I came home from work and I've been waiting for this question all day. Uh, I love uh, both you, uh, Tim, and Matt. You guys do a great job. Love the show. Uh, here's my question I'll make it short and sweet. Like a mini squirt. Uh, and I know that made Matt laugh because, you know, Matt always laughs at my call. Uh, what do you guys think about the Big Ten and the SEC both requesting four teams each into the playoffs? Before I take the answer, Julie, I feel like the rumors are true. Tim, you said a lot. They're going to a super conference. I don't fucking want that. You know, I'm coaching my 12 year old son uh, to be a, a USC football player in six years. What if he, well, I'm not going to say what if he doesn't, but for all those other kids that don't go to these big schools and they play at a Fresno State, what is it going to be? Like some NAIA type of deal? It sucks. What, what are your thoughts? Matt? I mean, I don't like it, but this is, this is the reality of the sport. Those are the two conferences with the most clout. And one thing to kind of incorporate into this discussion about the conferences in college football and college sports more broadly is, you know, when does Florida State work its way out of the ACC? Because you know that Florida State wants to do that. Can the Seminoles speed up the timetable for their exit from the ACC? And if they do speed up that timetable, you know, that's going to create a chain reaction uh, across the sport. You know, there's going to be at least one other school that would presumably join Florida State, if not more. Maybe the ACC begins to splinter and die. What happens with Stanford and Cal and SMU having just climbed aboard the ACC's rickety ship? How would television deals and television money be reworked? All while we have, you know, as referenced earlier, the college football playoff, thinking about 16 teams for 
2026 and more inventory that ESPN might might wind up sub licensing, maybe a game to Fox, a game to CBS, a game to NBC. Uh, so the Florida State ACC angle in terms of this larger balance of power among the conferences in college football, you know, we, we keep saying it, but maybe Florida State le elbowing its way out of the ACC could be the straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of football becoming independent from the NCAA, uh, not just independent from the, the other uh, sports, but we might just see a non-NCAA governed entity altogether, Florida State, uh, and it could be uh, the, the, the domino or the force that, that causes everything to finally collapse. So, we, you know, the things that we've been saying for a long time, Florida State leaving the ACC might be the, the event in the near future, which uh, unleashes, you know, that domino effect. It'll be very interesting to see. But, you know, like, like none of this is satisfying. None of this is good. I mean, I would still rather uh, live in a world at, along with Adam Lamparella, who's entered the chat. You know, I would still like to have the Big Ten versus the Pac-12 in the Rose Bowl on January 1st. I'd still like to see, you know, tradition and, and uh, in college football. Uh, I'd, I would lo love to have had, you know, as I've told, I've told this to Mark on many occasions in many of our Monday shows here at the Voice of College Football. Co what college football should have done, never needed the BCS, never needed uh, a 14 playoff, an 18 playoff, a 12 team playoff. What college football should have done in the late 90s was 1985 bowl system. But what you do is you add a plus one after all the bowls. So you still get that 1980s feel where, you know, you have the Sugar Bowl here and the Orange Bowl there and the Rose Bowl over there and the Fiesta Bowl over there and, and the Cotton Bowl over here. And all those games, you could have at least one of the two teams with its foot in the door with the possible shot of winning the national championship. Uh, the example I keep bringing up when, whenever I'm, I'm asked about this is 19, the 1983 season. January 2nd, 1984, you had Miami and Nebraska in the orange. You had number two, Texas in the cotton. You had number three, Auburn in the sugar. You had number four, Illinois in the rose. So you had four games, four games that all had at least something to do with the national title race. Whereas in the four team playoff, you have just two games that are affecting that. So the, the older system, the 1980s style system, it kept more fan bases interested in the national race, all while maintaining what Tim referred to earlier as the regionality of the sport. The SEC champion loved going to the Sugar Bowl. It marked a successful season. Big Eight champion loved going to Miami for the Orange. It marked a successful season. You had more teams able to celebrate success and yet also be in the national championship hunt precisely because it was a free-for-all and it wasn't funneled through two or four teams and, and these set aside games. Um, so if you had the traditional bowl system, but then you added that plus one game on top, you would have had Washington versus Miami in 1991. You would have had Colorado play Georgia Tech after all of the bowls were done at the end of the 1990 season and the January 1991 bowl games. That is the reform that college football should have taken but it never did, and it's hard to see with all that TV money out there. It's hard to see college football ever adopting that kind of system, you know, with all these playoff games and all that uh, playoff inventory uh, about to make that money. Uh, it's just hard to see that ever happening. But that's what college football should have done. It's unraveling. It just seems like it's constantly unraveling. Uh, did you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, I have one more question. Uh, so, this might be the last year because we know the NCAA is royally F work. Are you guys going to get the new NCAA football game making its triumphant return uh, this summer? And if you guys do, can I join your online dynasty? Thank you. I'll end the call. <laughs> you didn't know this, but Matt is a big gamer. It doesn't look like you would never guess it, but he's just, he just pours hours. No, uh, I think that he will. Uh, if we're talking like simulating dynasties and stuff like that, then uh, I think I'm on board. Um, 
I'll, I'll dust off this Xbox One that's sitting right here with literally collecting dust. Uh, and and maybe, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely in. I haven't played NCAA football in what, like eight, nine years? I don't know. It's been forever. I don't even know how many years it's been. Um, but I, I have... I kept all my little boxes and stuff from all the old. I mean, I, I collected all of the 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 old covers for all the NCAA games. I love that stuff. Um, but my brother is more of the a better video game player than I am. But I'm I'm absolutely getting involved without a doubt. Matt, you, you good? You got your uh, PS5 ready to go? I've uh, never gotten any modern uh, gaming system. The video game that the only video game I was ever any good at, Ms. Pac-Man. I, was, I thought you were say Atari Golf. I thought you were be. I thought you were the Atari Golf guy. No. No. The original my Atari. Pac -Man, here's my Ms. Pac-Man story. So there was a burger joint right next to my house in Phoenix, uh, and I, when I was like 25 years old, I must have cleared like 200 boards, and I had 698,700 points, and then the game ended like a computer glitch. So I actually defeated the game. You and, broke uh, the thing. Like, that's a mountaintop moment for me in video game history. Matt out there breaking games. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna get it. Um again. I, I bet you by now they're gonna make it so damn complicated. I tried playing in the NBA uh game, you know, and it's like like I remember when video games, you know, I remember when video games were like simple, you know. My my brother's in video game development, and like I, I try to play some of the games that you know. And I do. I, uh, trust me, I, I think they're all pretty fascinating. But I, I just, I don't know. There's just too many damn buttons now, and too many different like combinations you have to do. And uh, you know, you, you need a, you need a master's degree in order to be decent at these games. And that's when, that's when it becomes a bit difficult for us old guys. I'll tell you that right now. Okay, caller. Hello. Thank you for calling in. Uh, you're on with Matt and Tim. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, how you doing? This is uh, Matthew from Riverside. Matthew, do me a favor. Hang on one second. Uh, Matthew, hang on one second. Sorry. Uh, Adam, so sorry. Thank you so much for a super chat. Tim, USC baseball is an utter disgrace and destroying Dato is disgusting. Matt, do you think we have the talent on defense to compete next year? Well, let me get the first one. It's early. Uh, you know, I mean, let, let's just let the guys get going. Uh, I, I agree. I would say it's an utter disgrace, but man, they're not losing. They're getting shellacked. And I just, we got those bats got to come alive. Uh, it's early. Adam, don't give up. And then Dato, sometimes you got, you know, sometimes you got to break a couple eggs, you know, to make an omelet and uh, I, i'll tell you the truth i think mark colkin put a picture up of of what they did the the, the, the the ramps on dado the back of dado the ramps that would go up to the stadium those were like gone and i was looking at it and it just it just didn't it just didn't really like work in my head the fact that that dado the, the the stadium itself the field was still there but the, everything in the back you know behind the backstop and all the ramps all that stuff was all just level the bathrooms everything and to me, it was almost like a part of my childhood just got ripped away when, when I saw that. But, but Adam, you have to realize is they're, they're, they're going to make a new stadium. And, you know, I mean, at Dodgers, we're good. You know, we have our same stadium we've always had. Uh, but there's a lot of, you know, look at, look at the Tigers. I was lucky to go to Tiger Stadium before they tore it down. But I'll tell you what, it was in pretty bad shape, you know. Uh, there was nothing wrong with Dato, but I just think that here's one thing I thought conspiracy. Everyone, get your tinfoil hat on. You used to be able to watch spring practice and practices from Dato, all right? Little, little you know, well-known fact, actually. And you could watch, you could sit there, and you could watch the, the practices from the baseball field. Well, maybe they want, uh, you notice that they moved now, they, they, they turned it 90 degrees, so now you won't have that view anymore of what's going on in the practice field. Um, but the big thing is, is they want, they're putting in the new football-only facility, and that's what this big move is going to be. They needed space. They're, they're, they're pivoting things and changing things. They put in a different practice field as well. Um, but I think in the end, it's going to be a really, I think Dato is going to get, an, I'm, I'm sure like a, they cannot change the name. They got, the man won 11 national, uh, uh, he won 11 uh, World Series, five in a row. Matt, you know, right? Uh, that was written in, in Trojan's Wire this week. So make sure that you guys go check that out. Now we talked about Dato. Uh, you, you really have to realize that, Dato is a fixture, and that name, it will be Dato Field. I promise you the name will remain. All right. Adam asked me, Matt, do you think we have the talent on defense to compete next year? Uh, generally, but let's get a defensive tackle in the portal. All right. Now let's hit that phone call. Yeah. Thanks again, Adam. Um, caller, sorry about the big wait. Uh, what's your name? Where are you calling from again? Hey, how are you doing? This is Matt from uh, Riverside. Matt, thanks for calling. 
Hey, no problem. I just had a couple things I wanted to say. Number one, I was talking to a friend of mine at work, and he watches your show too, both of us, and we like to talk about it. And we, we were, we're involved in different fan forums and, and you know different shows, and we were laughing today because we were saying how there's actually such a value to these shows. You know, sometimes they don't think about it, but there really is this value. We think that the coaches don't listen. Nobody really listens. It's just a bunch of fans yelling and screaming and giving their opinions. But think about the USC football season and how it fell apart and how angry everybody was. And do you think Lincoln Riley didn't know about it? And by the end of the season, everybody was furious. People are yelling, fire, uh, fire him, get rid of him. You know, everybody was already looking for the next head coach that we wanted. And then suddenly Lincoln Riley gets it. And suddenly we see the dramatic transformation, the recognition that he needs a defense. He needs to put a defense first. He needs a new defensive strategy. And all these changes coming now, everybody's so happy. Suddenly we have all these new defensive coaches. We see new players coming in. And suddenly all these people, myself, my friend too, who were wanted uh, Lincoln Riley to get, go away, suddenly we love him again. Oh, Lincoln Riley is great. He's a great coach. And it just shows the value, though, of Sam saying what's going on, giving their opinions. It really does matter. If everybody had sat quietly and said, oh, it's okay, give him another year, everything's fine, you know what? No changes would have been made. Nothing would have happened. Everything would have stayed the same. But it shows like this and others, it, it matters. Our voices really do matter. And so I just want to say, you guys have a great show, and we really enjoy it. Now I'm going to tie it into one other thing. It's amazing how this season's USC basketball team is almost the same thing that happened to the football team. I mean, it is amazing. I happen to be a huge USC basketball fan. And I actually really like Andy Infill, too. But to see the complete... Um, uh, meltdown of the USC team this season is just unbelievable. And I have a theory about that. And I, my theory on that is just that Andy Infield has always coached from the underdog. Like right? he was, he, he came from Florida golf underdog school who did really good. He came to USC. He laid a new foundation over here, got a good program going. You have to give him props for what he did, but for the very first season, USC was supposed to be coming in as a big dog. We were supposed to be coming in from a position of strength this year. We are one of the favorite teams. People were saying, we might hit the final four. You know, the fans are dreaming, hey, how about if we won a national championship? And Andy bit into it, and the entire USC athletic department bit into this. They promoted this season huge. Andy really felt the pressure suddenly. And then when they had a few losses, more pressure. Then you look on the sidelines, you see LeBron there, more more pressure seeing them losing. And boy, it just snowballed and snowballed and snowballed. There's a huge difference from coaching from an underdog to being the big dog. That's and it's just it's stunning how it's so similar. That's a that's a very valid point. Um but you've always talked about the NCAA, you always talk about guard play, right? Guard play, guard play. That's how that the, the superior guard play is what helps you with the tournament. Well, the, exactly. you, you, what USC's had though, think about think about USC's big men. The the the, the issue and why they're having trouble closing because what it is is closing out games, right? They're getting these leads against good teams. Teams are bubble teams are going to go to the tournament. They get these leads going, and then late in the game, they're they're, they're, they're they'll miss shots, they'll miss layups, right? Um, but the big thing is, right. is 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 they're getting out rebounded like mad. You you need the USC bigs to be that you know that Evan Mobley, right? That Chemezi Metu. You know, right. you, you need you need you need someone's gonna go in there and 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 bang the boards. You know, you need to go back to Taj Gibson, right? You need a guy to go up there and get yeah. you those those rebounds, and it's and it's not okay. it's not happening. Even a Chavez, even Chavez Goodwin from a couple. Oh, of Goodwin ago. was exactly exactly, exactly. A great, player, though, a great college player or Nick Big Nick. Yeah, you know, you know what? Not it, pros, but very solid players. Enfield actually brought up. Um, that that whole point. He was talking about the fact that you need someone like who's uh, who's who's a tough, you know, you know, that toughness. You got guys that, that are, are are playing in the NBA right now, but you need the guy to go up and and get and get those those hard rebounds. And it just it just hasn't been there on on the on the team late in no. games. 
And that's what's really, no. you know, you, you, you're you thinking like Iwachuku is going to come around and start getting rebounds, you know. Um, but it's, it's just it's just not happening. You know, they're 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 getting they're getting way out. Of, they're getting doubled. They got doubled in rebounds last game. I know this is a football. Yeah. We'll lose everyone if we do this. But I would say this. It seems like the USC's. USC's uh, rebounding, right, is kind of like the, the run defense and the, and the run fits that we had last year. It's just a it, big chink in the exactly. armor that's really just destroying everything on the offense. Because offensively, um, I mean, they've had their moments, but they've been able to put up the points. But it's just rebounding late in games is killing them. And that's what I think we're seeing in, in basketball. That's, that's, so, that's so, so, Matthew, Matthew. Really good defense, defensive teams. This season, there's no defense. It, it, it's And what, this, what I want to say is that the key players return that should have kept it a, good, a strong defensive team. But you need that Chavez Goodwin, like you said. Matter of fact, uh, Enfield yeah. called him out by name, said, I don't have a Goodwin on the team. You know, he called him, he's called right. him his toughest player he's ever had. You know, so that's the glue yeah. piece that they're missing. But anyway, we're going to listen. Right. If you Matthew, keep walking this, they're, they're going to dish yeah. us. So we got to go. I want to I I bring this back to football, Matthew. Right. And I think a salient guys. point, Matthew, Matthew a, a, a salient point in terms of connecting this to football is that, you know, Lincoln Riley, he succeeded as a football coach, you know, coaching a favored All team. Right. He did that at Oklahoma. But of course, at USC, it, it's it has that hasn't happened yet. He hasn't yet entered a season as a clear-cut heavyweight at USC and delivered the goods. And the obvious point to make is is that at Oklahoma, he could win those Big Twelve games, sixty-five, uh, you know, fifty-two, you know, against Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, et cetera, and he couldn't do that in the Pac-12. The Pac-12 had a skill level which exposed every last limitation of USC's defense. So like that snapped Lincoln Riley out of the belief that he could win games 65-52. I mean, it worked for him in Oklahoma, but it, it didn't work for him at USC. And that, now we've finally seen uh, that that stylistic change. All right. So Wait, Matt, go ahead, going with this. Hold, hold on a second. Hey, listen, you guys, I got 94 of you guys right now. Um, I've been terrible at this, and I'm not doing it anymore because I think the more I ask for it, the less I get. But you guys, if there's anyone out there right now that are enjoying the show, uh, please make sure first you hit the like button. Thank you so much for being here. But also go ahead and, and subscribe to the channel uh, because I know it's kind of a slow season, around, but it's going to pick up pretty soon uh, with spring football. But try to get out to practice. Hopefully we'll have some some information for you. They don't, uh, they're, they're closed. The practice are closed. But at least we'll get some pictures and some interesting stuff from the, the practices coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, and then obviously a spring game will be there for that as well. So make sure you guys are subscribing so you guys can be here with us. Again, we'll continue the call-in show all the way through the season. So just get your piece of it. But if you could, if you had fun, if you've enjoyed it, hit that subscribe button. I'm going to fix the, the phone lines for next week, and then you can call in anytime you want. Go ahead, Matt. Sorry. No, just this point from John. Shout out to the women's basketball team. I have to cover that game against Colorado right now. So, Right. So we are wrapping up. Um, Looks like the fight. And also, you know, I think that they couldn't hear you. I don't I don't think Matthew could hear you on that last call. So, guys, I'm going to play with this again and see what's going on with – um, because it is it is kind of rigged up. I got a, a computer thing that goes through, that says the signal to my phone. It goes to my soundboard. That goes through Bluetooth. Um, you know, new cars, new Bluetooth to cars. I think it's screwed something up there. I'm going to have to figure all that stuff out for next week. Um, but we appreciate everyone being here as always. Uh, this is – the what's the first? It won't be the last. I'm telling you guys, you know, for a long time, the phone calls weren't really a thing on these these uh, shows. You're gonna start seeing people call, take more phone calls because you guys are great. You make our job very easy. I look forward to this. Not that I don't like mind seeing Mark and talking to Mark, but uh, I I look forward to these phone calls every week. You guys are truly awesome. If you want to hit me up during the week, many of you guys do. Uh, you can follow us uh, on our socials. Uh, Matt, you can get Matt at Trojans Wire. You can get me at. Uh, Tim underscore Prangley. Please feel free to hit me up on Twitter or Instagram. I love the conversation with you guys. Again, I love these phone calls. Uh, any interaction we can have. You can give me any ideas you have. We have some great ideas for shows we're going to come up with. Um, Matt's got to get to the game. I'm losing my voice again because I'm talking way too much, but we have... Do we get another super chat? Yeah, we do. Let's get this uh, another super chat from... Adam. Adam. Gosh, Adam. Thanks again. Adam, thanks again. Uh, here we go again. Another parade of incompetent administrators and coaches. I don't know. 
All right. Uh, from Helted to Bone to Full to Riley, and now Data was destroyed. They may as well hire him. Okay, look. Adam, it's going to be okay, man. No, it's the other way around. I do think there was a lot of competence going on for a number of years at USC. I uh, just didn't have the right pieces in place. I, I think that you, you know, we kind of got you to come around a little bit a couple of weeks ago, uh, Adam. I think we're going to be okay. These defensive hires are legitimate. I think that uh, Danton Lynn is going to be special. You already see Eric Henderson making lots of traction with these recruits. I think things are going to work out. Um, believe me, if this doesn't work, I don't know what's going to help USC because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty amazing if this defense does is not successful. And we've been asking for a long time. All we need is a defense. That's a good defense. We do not need the, we say every time the 85 bears, the 2008 Trojans, the, the, the 01 uh, Miami Hurricanes. We don't need these defenses, right? We, you know, the the 20, 2021 Georgia Bulldogs, right? We we don't we don't need these kind of defenses. We need we need a good defense. I think we have it now, Matt. So um appreciate all of you guys being here as always. Remember, Monday night we have the show always every Monday night with um with uh, uh Mark Rogers. We have the Monday night show at 8 p.m. 11 Eastern. And then every Friday, right here, all the phones fixed. We have the call in show. Appreciate all of you guys being here. Um, I am going to let Matt go and I'm going to uh, myself get out of here. So thanks again. We will talk to you all soon. Right on, everybody. Oh, and free Reggie. <laughs>